you having a solid understanding of where you lie on that continuum of skill is really important as well as knowing what's your end goal, like what is it that you want to do. Build your strengths, but manage your weaknesses. Know that you're meant for something bigger than just you. You know, there's like a science and there's an art to coaching and let's apply some science to the way that we train people. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to the Strength Connection Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kurkowski. Thanks so much for joining me today. All right, so today I am rejoined by a good friend of mine, Strong First Team Leader, Oz Aponte. I recently had Oz on the podcast and our conversation was amazing. It felt like we were just getting started. And in that one, we talked a lot about big paradigms and theory. And in this episode, we went into the nitty gritty of training at the beginner, the intermediate, and the advanced levels. Oz is a wealth of knowledge, truly practices what he preaches. It was so awesome to dive deep into the best practices with him. All right, so with that, let's get right to it. If you like this episode, you wanna show the podcast some love, then please rate and review it wherever you're listening. And don't forget to subscribe and catch all new episodes that are dropped every single week. All right, thanks so much, guys. Now let's get on with the show. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Oz, what's up, man? Good to see you, man. Good stuff. Sunny California, man. Can't beat it down here. Yeah, I'll rub it in, rub it in. So <laughs> as I'm looking, it's not snowing out here. I won't even go into the weather of upstate New York, but I, I wish we were doing this in person towards you. But if we can't do it there, dude, it's so great to see you via Zoom here. Likewise. Yeah, it was a blast connecting with you last time. It was not too long ago that we you know, connected for first time really diving. I absolutely loved uh, chatting with you, hearing about your upbringing and strength and the story. And for today, this is pretty cool because we we talked a lot about big paradigm, kind of big picture and ethereal type stuff, which is always a blast to get into. I love uh, diving into that. But today, I want to dive into some more practical aspects with you. And I guess to frame this up, Oz, to to let you roll, like I'm always interested in the differences of what should be practiced for kind of the beginner, the intermediate and the advanced. And I think there is some subjectivity to it. Um, we talk a lot, I think, about the beginner level of you should be in this mindset. It needs to be disciplined. That's great. But like, are there actually best exercises, are there best practices for the beginner uh, with stuff? So that's kind of where my minds have been off. Like, do you see kind of a difference of importance kind of on a big picture first of like beginner versus intermediate into advanced? Yeah, you know, I, I've given this a lot of thought and and I'm really interested in knowing what, what you think about it as well, you know, like how this all meshes because one of the things I took away from our first conversation was how much we had in common in terms of training and how we see mm -hmm. things and evaluate things. So let me propose a couple of things and to answer that question. Like a really important part of understanding like what's going to, the process is going to be is understanding where you lie on that timeline, right? Mm. So understand, like, I think, you know, I believe that you are someone who places a lot of um, value in the FMS system, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've done some, um, the the vestibular system that uh, should, uh, original strength, is that original strength? I don't know much about, I've talked to quite a bit with OS. I know more of FMS than anything else on the okay. movement side, yeah. So having a solid understanding of where you lie on that continuum of skill is really important as well as knowing what's your end goal, like what is it that you want to do, right? Mm. And, and that's going to dictate a lot of how you approach some of these things. In the context of somebody who wants to just be generally in better shape and have a better quality of life, right? This is just for you, be a better parent, be a better husband, be a better brother, be a better friend and all that through the, the, the gifts and the benefits that we get from physical fitness that go beyond physical, but they make us mentally healthier. They make us spiritually healthier, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, to think a broad base, understanding where you lie. So if you have some deficiencies early on that you see, then I think you want to invest some time and energy into bringing those skills up so that they're in part with the rest of your skills. So if you're a really strong guy, but you mm -hmm. lack in the mobility side, it, could be a, it would be a good investment for you in the beginning to start right away putting that work in, right? Don't wait right. until it becomes an issue. And some coach tells you, hey, Mike, you know, you're strong cell, man, but you got to work on your mobility. Don't wait until that happens. I think we can start, you know, dipping in our toes into those waters right away. Mm -hmm. and that way, your skill would elevate at the same rate. Mm -hmm. Therefore, guaranteeing that you have a much longer and satisfying career and relationship with exercise. That's a good point. You know, it's interesting that you bring up the mobility side of it too. You know, in uh, 
you know, I had a rule in one of the last seminars I did, which was, you know, build your strengths, but manage your weaknesses, you know? So it's like the, you know, oftentimes, because I know since I started working more from home and I sit more, I didn't even realize it, but my mobility started to go down that path where it's like you started to see, like I could always do the strength practices, but little by little, I always had from doing FMS screens and stuff like that. Like I could, I'd had a fine leg raise, uh, you know, act a straight leg raise. I had a fine, you know, range of motion in my shoulder mobility. So I always kind of know I'm like, okay, I'm good. But oftentimes it's, that's almost like a, like an intermediate and advanced, like when you think like, okay, now you've got some practice under your belt. You don't think you need to go back to these things. And that was my own mindset for a while. I was like, oh, like, I'm fine. Like I can do this test. Boom. That's fine. All right. I can go right into swings and snatches. Cause that's what I want to do. It's like, but then realize like, oh shit. Like I actually had to rebuild my mobility a little bit more. And probably, I mean, you know, hearsay is always, you know, 20, you know, hindsight is always 2020, you know, it would have been great to do it six months ago, but I agree in there. It's like, get it. I like to get a broad base of everything right off the bat. Which implies that you got to understand, uh, have an understanding as to what fitness means to you. Mm -hmm. And hopefully if you have a really good coach, they can help you kind of like broaden your view upon what that is. Right. Cause to some people, maybe fitness is just being cardiovascularly elite, right. If they can run a marathon, that's what it means to be fit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as we know, endurance athletes are notorious for having strength deficits that can seriously impair their performance and their longevity. So mm -hmm. having, having the education piece, whether it's your coach or a friend or just your general interest in these topics that you can go online and research and see like, you know, is, is there something that I can do to make uh, this activity that I love, like running, even more enjoyable and longer lasting. Can I, can I find that information? And I think that's part of it, which is so wonderful that that's kind of what we're doing here, right? Because somebody inevitably will listen to this. And if just even mm -hmm. one person out there listens to this and they go like, you know what, I'm going to reevaluate what my basic skills are and see where I can make some improvements. And maybe, maybe that gives them another 10 or 15 years of athletic life into them, you know, and, and that's the importance mm -hmm. of, of a podcast like this, that they spread that word out. Right. Yeah. I always think like it's, it's hard. I don't know if you ever see this, but you've been coaching for a long time. I have as well. And sometimes still it's challenging to get into the mindset of a beginner who's just getting started to kind of get that big, broad base out there. And I know I've made the mistake more than probably anybody out there of like, I used to throw so much information at clients right off the bat from there till actually what the FMS actually was one of those things that gave me a framework where I'm like, okay, I can talk about stability and I can talk about mobility. There might be a million other exercises that are, you know, important and things to talk about, but it's like, all right, if we can dwindle these down into a couple things to work with, it makes it a lot easier to digest for the person. Cause I always said like with, with a beginner, what's the most important thing that needs to get started. Well, they need to build the routine and have discipline down regardless of, of what they have. And the easier they do to get there, then once you get that down, then I think all the other stuff starts to open up a lot easier. You can teach those things yeah. a lot more. This is why I wanted to bounce this off of you because I'm clearly, like, I was coming from that technical side, right? Like mm -hmm. these are the elements and the pieces that you need to put in place. Now, what you're talking about now is that tactical, how to apply all those little things, right? In yeah. the sense of like, right? Like, I mean, you just explained that beautifully. And, and I think that's really important too. And I think that my, my view on this wouldn't have been complete without that point that you just made. Um, I think you need to understand how to apply it moving forward. That's really important. Yeah. I, it was something that I've honestly gone back and forth with quite a bit over the last year because I got deep down the rabbit hole of intuitive training, which I think still is phenomenal. But I was almost bringing it to a lot of people who were still in a beginner phase right off the bat. And I was like, and it wasn't connecting as much as I thought, you know, and as a coach, like we're the eternal optimist sometimes. It's like, yes, exactly. This is going to happen. Like they're going to get this down and then they're going to trust their body. And it's like, all of a sudden I was like, oh shit, they don't know. The, what their body feels like yet. They just need to build the discipline up and they need to enjoy the process. This was actually in a, in a technical piece. Uh, oftentimes in, especially in strong first and FMS, like you teach the swing first, that's like the foundation. I found with early beginners, teaching them how to snatch first made them really enjoy the process actually a yeah. lot more than getting into the swing. And it was something that 
like that. Yeah, I used to think that that was such an advanced technique to work with. Where I was like, no, if you actually, if you teach somebody how to snatch properly, it seemed like people got into it a lot more from there. It was a weird thing that just kind of came about. You know, I love to hear stories like this because I can be pretty like um, hard nosed about like this is the order. You know, like I'm just so traditional in my learning and in my own training and stuff like that. But I, it's important for me as a coach that I open my mind to having alternatives. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, if I get that one client walking into the door and I can identify through some way, I don't know exactly, it's not really the, the topic of the conversation, but if I can p- figure out like, maybe this guy will be a good candidate to teach him the snatch first and mm-hmm. that will really get him going. You know, I want to have the flexibility in my own paradigm to be able to make that decision and not get, get stuck in like, no, 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 buddy. You're going to do deadlifts for six months and then you're going to do swings for six months. And then you're going to really have to show me that your press is good in your Turkish getup before you snatch here. So you're looking at three years minimum. Right. Yeah. I know it is. It's a tough thing too, because yeah, if you deadlift for six months straight, you're, I mean, go listen to Hector. I mean, he does yeah, amazing yeah. stuff with that. Hector's also a veteran of 15 years plus of, you know, black belt and jujitsu and a master of movement from there. And I think sometimes I know I was such a, a victim of it myself of doing it, of just putting that application into beginners right off the bat when it's yeah. like what I found with the snatch and we did that is, okay, now we're making it really fun. And if people want to especially learn kettlebells, like what are the things that they usually see? They see clean and jerks, they see snatches. It's like, well, is there a way that we can still do the foundations, but teach them maybe something that's quote unquote, a little bit more advanced and actually they get that down and all of a sudden it's a much more enjoyable process for them, which seemed like it built the discipline a lot faster. Which is a really important thing that I kind of hammered on last time, right? Like this needs to be enjoyable or else you're not going to do it on a consistent basis for any amount of time that's actually going to benefit, you can benefit from. And, you know, so many times on your show, you've talked about, you know, there's like a science and there's an art to coaching. And I think what you're alluding to now is just that. And it comes with experience. When you started this whole line of, of, of dialogue, it was about, you know, in the beginning I did this, but then I realized that if I did this other thing, mm-hmm. you know, having people have some fun, it can really expand things. And I think I need to incorporate that into that answer. The next time I'm asked this question, I need to say it needs it needs to be fun in the beginning so that people really get up for it. And when they yeah. show up, man, they're like 100% there and present because these are all things, you know, I mean, this kind of goes to the mindset that we're probably going to talk more about later. But, mm-hmm. you know, like, how are you walking into the session? And again, if, if they're excited about it, they're probably going to get a lot more out of it. You know, yes. forget all the technical stuff. You know, it can be the best technician in the world. But if that enjoyment factor is not there, we're lacking something. So I see this is why you are the man to talk to about these things. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, my head's too big now already. So, no, it is. I, I forget who I talked to about that, about just the concept of goal setting. And like, you know, I, I still think it's something as an industry at large, we can get better at because, you know, people like we have a goal. Oftentimes it's like, oh, what's your goal? And then immediately as you say, it, you go right into an action plan. It's like, well, have you really attached to that goal? Like, why is it? And I think one of those questions, especially at the beginning steps to ask more is like, like what gets you excited? Like what's, what's enjoyable to, you You know, what do you enjoy about this? Oh, you heard about, you heard about kettlebell training. What was it about it that looked really cool? What movements were there and stuff like that. And I think that's where more it's, it seems like sometimes we can get very regimented and strict of like, Oh, well, you need to, you need to do this forever and ever. It's like, and even like the, you know, you should do 50 naked getups with no weight before, you know, you get in your hand. I'm like, okay, I understand, I understand it. However, if we're working with somebody who wants to be a better brother, be a better sister, be a better, you know, father, you know, just get better, get some weight in your hand after a few times and just, just give it a shot. I'll never forget this story. Actually, Chris told me this was when uh, Doug Nepadal, he was an old master instructor with strong first. Yeah. yeah. You know, Doug, and uh, they were talking about teaching the get up. And I think he just out of nowhere, it's just like, I'll teach you to get him in two seconds. Everybody stand up. And he taught the get up from the ground up, like from the top down. The top down. Yeah, exactly. And then everybody got it right away. He's like, yeah, let's stop over fucking complicating this stuff with people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I know. Look, I, I've been guilty of making things way too technical in the beginning and in the past, but um, you know, I, I'm completely open and honest about it. And I'm all, I'm always willing to change my ways, you know, like, and, and learn from my mistakes. And I think that's something that moving forward, I like to implement more. And it's that fun factor and making things as simple as possible. Like I think that's the next evolution of us, the coach, 
mm -hmm. is to really try to like, you know, get away from some, because I think there's like, if you and I got together, I think we could really nerd out on all the technicalities of, you know, this move, mm -hmm. right? But again, we got to consider the circumstance in the person in front of us, you know, which we're talking about the client, right? Mm -hmm. If they're having fun, man, can it, like Cheryl Crow said, is it really that bad, right? <laughs> <It's too laughs> happy. It can't be that bad. Oh, that's beautiful right there. So we got Cheryl Crow in the pro in the program here. That's beautiful. So, so with with programming for you, us, like if somebody comes in and they're just learning these aspects of movement, do you have go-to programs, go-to movements or protocols that you work with right off the bat as kind of like the the bridge to build into everything else? What are those things that you start to implement right away? Yeah, well, like you, the FMS is an important piece of my 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 tool set, right? Um, along with that goes the uh, the ground force method uh, sequences on the floor mm -hmm. that are based on a lot of the movements that we teach in Strong First, but also the the techniques or the strategies that we would use to help someone better, you know, range of motion um, with within the 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 difficulties that they may have within the FMS, right? So if they have some deficiencies in the FMS or asymmetries the sequences uh ground force method they can help you you know get those things back mm -hmm. into place and they're they have an element of playfulness which is exactly what we're talking about and that's really okay. helpful in the beginning because it's not that mundane okay i'm gonna just do this thing with my sure. hip now but rather you're going through the sequences that almost look almost like flowy and okay. dancey. And you're getting down in the ground and back up so it can be a very powerful stimulant to the nervous system of a brand new student to, for them to walk away feeling successful like yeah. I did this very novel and cool thing today. So that's one thing that I use right yeah. away. Another if thing you can, I, if you can stay on ground force for a second, I want to know yeah. a little bit more because I don't know much about it. But I've I've seen things like MoveNet or Primal Move or like yeah. Animal Flow, which it seems like it has it maybe kind of like a sister based program on it. But ground force method was built out from the FMS system. If I'm if I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong. That's my understanding as well. And I, I, I'm not an expert in, in ground force method. I just use it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I've used it a lot for myself and for my clients. <clears throat> I just want to put that out there that I'm not, you know, some, I'm mm -hmm. not speaking for them. But yes, it does have a lot of influences from the functional movement screen. And again, what I like about it is that it takes away that mundane nature of, okay, I'm going to work on my shoulder mobility now, which look, some people love that. And I think people like you and I, we would we would get a kick out of it. Yeah, I'm working on my shoulder mobility. My press is going to be better. My Turkish getup is going to be better. But not everyone feels like that. So how, mm -hmm. what they've done in, to put it into this, like what I like to call sequences, right? Like, I mean, it's not really like some special term, but yeah. I like that. It reminds me of dance warm-ups when you like mm -hmm. roll down to the floor and you do like, you, you rehearse part of the movements that you will eventually do in your dance phrase in your warm up, so that neurologically you're priming yourself for those things. And by the time you yes. get to the actual meat and potatoes of the dance class and you're doing the phrases across the floor 100%, you feel well prepared to perform it at your best. And so, mm. with ground force, I think it does a very, it has a similar effect into your strength practice. I love the flow of mobility so much more. Like the static kind of corrections and stuff like that, like I, I know them. I do them when I remember them. I'm not the best at it, but honestly, like working with Brett, like Brett has a great uh, video on, uh, I think the functional movement YouTube page of like a time crunch mobility circuit, which has some ground force method flow into it. That makes it so much more fun. Actually, it's like, I actually enjoy doing it. Like that's become more of like a meditative practice of getting into training, yeah. um, you know, for, because I've got some locked up ankles, I've got some knee issues and stuff that actually uh, like, Instead of just like doing the stick, doing the foam roller, which you do, but you almost kind of begrudgingly do it. It's like, I know the benefits of it. And again, it's like to make it a little bit more enjoyable, like the, the flows, it just, it seems like it has just a little bit more of a playfulness to it. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do believe so. And, and so it's beneficial for us as coaches. It's beneficial for the clients because they, again, they do something novel and the nervous system loves novelty, you know? Um, so the more you can add that little spice into your training, whether it's mm -hmm. for yourself or your clients, um, there's a lot to be gained from that. Um, in addition to the ground force, I also use a lot of um, gait evaluations because those provide an incredible amount of information about a person's nervous system and their level of physical functioning, including how their eyes, their eyes are working and their inner ear. 
Uh, so a variety of tests to um, assess balance and assess um, how well their eyes work is important for movement because if you're deficient in your vestibular system, your uh, um, onboard GPS system that keeps you, you know, which way is up and what direction mm. you're moving into in your eyes can affect movement dramatically. Um, for uh -huh. example, uh, runner's knee most often is a vestibular issue, not a proprioceptive one. Because let's think really? about it. Yeah, it's really weird, but it is. And I'll, I'll try to explain it to you the best sure. I can, but think about it. If, if you're going to go out for a run and you start, and it's not even until 15 minutes into your run that the pain kicks in, you got to question then how does that work? How yeah. proprioceptively that my sensors, my receptors, right? All of that proprioception going up into the brain and being interpreted and the output is this pain signal. Why does it take that long? And the reason that we believe is it takes that long is because it's not proprioceptive, it's vestibular. And it takes you about that long to tire out or fatigue your ear. And when it does, it sends the pain signal to stop you from doing the activity that it perceives as being dangerous, which is running. So if you have a proprioceptive deficiency in your right side, most likely it will be the right side knee that hurts. And it's just trying to get you to stop because it perceives that this activity, activity is not safe at the moment. Hmm. I feel a deficiency. I may fall. I don't want to fall. I don't want you to break an arm. Let's do right. this pain to get you to stop. Wow. That's fascinating. It's, it's, it does. It makes sense of like, why does the pain show up 10, 15 minutes down the line? Why doesn't it start right away? And the easy thing, oh, well, it just takes a bit. It's a little bit overuse. It's like, wow, I never even thought of it as a, a possible vestibular system issue. And so apply to what we do, that, that could, if you're like Hector was talking about doing that list for an hour, yeah. <laughs> right? Like if, if you're doing something like that, right, that requires a central, uh, uh, and let's just say a small amount of mental endurance, like this man is so disciplined, dude, and so mm -hmm. focused to do that, to maintain that lock for 60 minutes, every yeah. minute, boom, da, boom, da. and he, it wasn't like he was pulling 135 pounds. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, no, like, he's got, yeah. he's, he's got four plates on there. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. So, mm -hmm. so for something like that, if, and, and luckily he, you know, he never said that he experienced pain. Let me see him as an example, but if you midway through start to develop some pain, a, a good place to look at would be visual and vestibular deficit. So you would want to know that your peripheral vision is equal on both sides, that you can track something with your eyes with relative ease, right? Like if I asked you, I want you to show me this movement, right? And I am all clunky and weird right. and I can't coordinate it. Would you feel comfortable putting weight on me? Probably not. I'm going to guess, right? Right. Like, look, if I can't even do it with my arm, what's going to happen when you give me a 12 kilo? So the eyes are similar. If you were to look at a target and then follow it with your eyes, just your eyes, not moving your head, you want to see a smooth motion of the eyes tracking the target. Mm. If you can't do that, it's going to affect your movement. Because oftentimes we find visual targets to stabilize ourselves. What do we tell people when they're learning snatches or swings? Six to 10 feet in front of you, right? Yeah. On the floor. So if you have a lot of difficulty doing that, it's going to fatigue your eyes, which can affect your movement. Right. It's going to give you the pain signal because the brain is going to be like, uh oh, the eyes are not working anymore. This is not mm -hmm. very safe anymore because the nervous system is always fighting to do two things for you. Keep you alive. Um, and make you move better. Right. And, and in that survival instinct, you know, it will perceive things that are not safe as like, we don't want to do this. So pain is very complex, but in, in our scope, like what we do, we work with movement. We teach people how to move better, how to move more efficiently, strongly, fast, all that. It's important to understand that these can be things that can affect it. And so that's part also, in addition to the FMS, I'm looking at the gait, I'm looking at the eyes, I'm looking at the vestibular system, uh, to see that there's some baseline tests that I can do. Sure. And if, if the person can can perform them, then I'm like, sweet, let's do that. Okay. If if they show a deficiency, then I will try my best to convince this person. Let's try to address this before we move forward, so that when you hit the, the round with the kettlebells, you're gonna hit it in a full out sprint. Right. You right. Have to hold you back. You can go right to a snatch. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's that is so interesting. I've never like really heard of that as a. A testing do it's so the body's so fascinating with that because everybody we think back we think 
balance is like, oh, like, can you do like a, can you do a hurdle step? Can you step on one leg and stuff? Exactly. Don't even realize that it could be coming from a lot of, you know, different areas. I think it's common knowledge. Like if you have like an earache or like an ear infection that throws your balance off and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, it's not just happenstance. It's like all these things, you know, pop up the eyes, especially in like lifting is so interesting too. Cause, um, I remember hearing Pavel when we were talking about pull-ups where, where to look. And naturally, if you just a little bit look up, it just shuts off your anterior, lights up your posterior. If you look that straight ahead, the difference of what you can do. And, you know, if you're doing like, you know, just sets of five or something like that, and you're, you know, a decently strong person, that's fine. But you're trying to do like a beast tamer and like a single rep, every little thing counts. And all of a sudden I realized like the difference in my pull-up of just technique how it felt afterwards. Cause I used to get that little bit of that, you know, uh, twinge going on in the neck. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Seeing where you, seeing where you look is that's huge. I wouldn't even thought of that as an, as an assessment. Yeah. I mean, look, it, 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 about 20 years ago, you know, the, the whole functional lumen things kind of started mm-hmm. going on. And I, and I talk about like the Paul checks of the world, right. And yep. gray and, um, this great cook. And then there's Gary Gray, who is the great Institute. Yes, like he does a lot of like physical therapy stuff. And that was another thing that I read widely in the beginning and stuff. And there was just a lot of emphasis on like, let's apply some science to the way that we train people. I think that was like, you know, obviously the people that have degrees and were working with like top level athletes and sports teams and things like that, they would go to school. They were kinesiologists and, you know, physical therapists, uh, all that stuff. So they had a different education, but for the regular trainer out there, right, that we just go get certified, you know, and then then we go work with clients, you know, a lot of that information wasn't available. And it was around the the late uh, 90s and early 2000s that really started to kind of flourish. Mm -hmm. And and it's just been like this golden age of information for trainers and all of the different things that we can do. I, I, for some reason, I have it stuck in my head that you're like a original strength buff but i don't know i i think you no because i talked to him i fa- i fanboyed him quite a bit so okay yeah so you i think you had someone in on your show was it tina perhaps i had kelly i just had kelly on when we were talking about that quite a okay. bit and um i had danny on you know da- um, danny it was yeah, danny. danny yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that yeah. came up and i remember thinking like oh man i wish i could be in this conversation yes. right now that's, that's, oh yeah oh you yeah know? but but you know like a lot of what they do is based on the vestibular system Mm. And I don't think a lot of people know that, you know, yeah. you're just doing the little, uh, the, the resets, right? You're doing yeah. the resets on the floor and stuff, but all that head movement, guess what? It's directly stimulating your vestibular system. It's so funny because they, I remember that conversation, you know, well, and what I think Danny and Tim do so well with OS is they, they, they talk to it like with as little kind of information as possible, like do this, you're going to feel better. And then you yeah. go do it and then you feel better. It's like, great. Don't need to worry about anything else. Now go do your other stuff and kind yeah. of work with that. But actually the deep science behind it, like, yeah, there's a reason why though they're working with this and it's the proprioception, it's the vestibular system, everything there. They've got a great system there. That's why, you know, they've done so well of, uh, you know, connecting movement with so many different areas. So I am dying to go to that store, bro. I'm dying yeah. to go to it. I can't wait to go I've Yeah, been for years. And it's just so many things out there. There's so many great things, you know? And you, yeah. you got to try to like uh, budget your time and energy and all that. But I really want to go um, yeah. and take this cert because I think it's super valuable. Yeah. When I talk with Alex, because he does so much stuff with pressing reset and, you know, pr- pressing for, I mean, if you're a kettlebell person, like, you know, pressing is the ultimate, like, and huh. it's such a deep, I have such a love hate relationship with the kettlebell press. Cause like some days it just feels Perfect. Which is even weird, like a single bell, like a one arm, one rep max. I've actually worked to get your eyes involved in it. It actually builds your awareness of it. But like it's it's different in, in different practices, like you can feel just the different groove and the different flow of it. But the press is another thing I think for beginners is really good to 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 work with. You know, it's like just getting that groove of of the bell. I think that's one of the best things to build for a beginner, especially with the kettlebell, because it naturally puts you into that groove of your shoulder architecture and stuff. And you can build a lot of strength really fast. And especially for people who are just getting started to build strength really fast, that's going to get the buy-in really quick. It's going to help them work with everything else. A hundred percent. I know. And I know we're going to talk about a few other things as to what exercises are better and all that stuff. Yeah. And I have my thoughts on the press and we'll get there, but, um, uh, the, uh, the, the half kneeling uh, uh, 
half million version of the press that comes from FMS. I learned it in FMS. Mm-hmm. Like I had never done that before. And if I did, it wasn't intentional. It was just some weird stuff. But, but I love doing the half million version. In, yes. To the, to the point where now when I, most of my pressing sessions, um, I do a variety of, of uh, versions, like one kettlebell, double kettlebell simultaneous, seesaw, half kneeling, sots. Yep. And uh, yeah, I try to get all of those in there because. Um, do you do Z press? I do actually. <laughs> um, and I don't do it as much as I should as and in terms of volume compared with those other versions that I just gave you. I should probably incorporate that more. Mm-hmm. It's uh, more of a, like, a, I'm feeling really great and loose and groovy and top, yeah. and I'll go and do some Z presses, but I need to do them more for sure. That's going to be beneficial for my training. Thanks, man. <laughs> oh, no doubt. Absolutely. So we're here for the SOTS press is so interesting just because of the mobility factor of it oh, as yeah. well. Like it's such a, it's such a, I mean, that's a badass exercise to do, but to see, to see somebody do like a double SOTS press on there, regardless of weight, like that's a lot of good body awareness. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I love. I like, you know, at this level of the uh, of my my trajectory, I love movements that are rather complex like that. And the SOTS provides that, as you just explained. When I look at it, when I first looked at it, I think one of the first people I saw doing SOTS presses back in the day was uh, Steve Carter. Mm-hmm. And and then eventually I going through some of the RTC uh, events, I saw you know some other badasses doing it at some point I don't remember. But there's a story about Bud Jeffries, who you know passed away. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was one of the only men that could soft press the beast. <laughs> Full squat, dude. Boom. <laughs> But Bud is just a different animal. It's like if you just saw if you saw Bud on the street, like and you didn't know who he was, yeah. you would not realize this is one of the strongest guys ever on the planet. Like that was insane. And then he's like doing the press and then shooting a bow and arrow, like through a <laughs> through a balloon of fire and stuff. Oh gosh, like yeah. He was a great was- man. And I, I regret not having had the pleasure of meeting him, you know, when mm-hmm. I was going coming through the RTC system. Uh, Cause then he kind of like broke off, you know, I, we never really saw him again in any of our, our events or anything like that, mm-hmm. but they always had incredible, I mean, still do great admiration for this man and what he did, his work, his body of work. He was an author and an athlete and a coach and, yeah. and a poet. And I mean, the man was, yeah and, a, yeah. and a pastor, like he did so much with, for, his, for Noah's army and his son. Yeah. It was definitely gone too soon. I, I was fortunate. I got a chance to have bud on the uh the last podcast when me and chris host him on and he was just one of the guys that was just such a great dude and everything about him was just giving you know from stuff it's one thing i i talked about with people at the beginning in goal setting was like know that you're meant for something bigger than just you you know it's like it's a it's ethereal there's a spiritual vibe to it on it but i think it's so important of realizing that especially for for people who are getting started, it's like they have, oftentimes it's like they have so much like they're trying to figure for themselves and fix for themselves, not realizing that them benefiting it, getting stronger, like learning, like mastering a skill and stuff that just spreads out to other people. Like there's an abundance factor of that where it's like other people that they know start seeing them do stuff. It's like, you know, crack up. I have a client who's 80 years old. She's been training with me for 13 years now. And like the people she's around are like your normal 80 year olds that don't understand it. Don't get it. I'm like, they see what you're doing. I'm like, they, and they respect it. They just don't know how to, you know, how to take it. Cause they're not doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like your last guest would talk a little bit about this too, about, you know, you have to believe in that. Right. And, and if it takes you too long, it's like, you've wasted a lot of time. Just believe in it from the beginning. I mean, if talking about, um, what should a beginner do? Well, that's part of it. Like see, see yourself in that future self, right? Like mm-hmm. see your, see the person that you want to become in terms of like this environment yeah. and believe that that's possible. And then take the steps every day that are going to get you there. Yeah. And then, then we can add all the, the, the technical stuff that we talked about earlier, but super important to have that vision. And most importantly, have um, conviction and that can become a reality. Yeah, no doubt. So I want to dive into some exercises here and, and ask why you hate the press. So no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so no, like, un, like underrated versus overrated kind of exercises in here. Yeah. Like, I know it's always subjective on there, but it's always a blast to talk to. Like, let's start with, I guess, overrated exercises, like a specific kind of like in the world that we're in, are there certain exercises that you think a lot of people value a lot more than need to be, whether it be risk versus reward or just bang for your buck? Kind of what are those that you think are just 
not as great as most people think. Okay, overrated, right? Yeah. The bench press. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, Doc Hartle is going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> why, do, why do you think though? Okay, there's some benefits to it. There are many benefits to it. Um, it, it I guess a one, as I was thinking about this, I, yeah. I was kind of formulating this idea that it, it is highly dependent on the person's goals, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're Chris, uh, C bum, right, and you want to win the Olympia, which you just did this last weekend, yay. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. then bench pressing is going to be very important for your development as a bodybuilder. Like you need right. that. It's a very important element. If you are a mixed martial artist, the bench press is basically worthless to you. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really help you in the activity that you perform on the regular. If you are a lineman, we, the, the argument can be made that, yeah, there is some carryover into what you're going to do on the field. If you're a receiver, probably not. Right. So there's so much variance between what is the ultimate goal? So if you are a, a practitioner like us, right? Like we just want to have a better quality of life, right? We're not trying to go to the Olympics. Then the question is, are you going for aesthetics or are you going for performance? Are you going for both? If you're pure aesthetic aesthetics, then you have to do it. That's a necessary thing that you got to do to have that chiseled physique and yep. the proportions that you want and all that stuff. If you are a, an executive, high power executive with five kids, and a wife and a big family and a lot of responsibility. And what you want is that minimalist approach, then this is worthless to you. You don't want to spend time doing that. There's a lot of other better things, which I'm sure we're going to talk when we talk about the underrated exercises yeah. that, that are going to get you more bang for your buck. It is including the overhead press will probably be a better investment of your time instead of yeah. doing the bench press. In terms of risk versus reward, I do think that if you don't have the proper technique, there's a lot of risk for um for you to get hurt like yeah i mean we 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 hear it all the time oh dude i used to bench like a lot and i jacked up my shoulders yeah this is like pretty common it's not anything that it's an outrageous claim even people that are, are really good at bench pressing have gotten injuries from bench pressing you know 100 percent. Um, yeah i think it is it's one of those it's one of those exercise it feels really good to bench press like when you have a good 100%. technique down like it really does but I think for so, especially, especially men in our culture too, we get tighter in the front of our body. We get weaker in the back of our body, you know, especially if you're sitting a lot, you're getting tight. It's one of those exercises that you are tightening up something that's already tight where I think, yeah, that alternative, especially in the kettlebell world, the overhead press, there's a mobility aspect to it that you need to be able to have some thoracic spine extension, have some control of it, you know, stack that arm a little bit more. So, you know, I think, you know, when I was going for SFL, I was, be I benched forever and I have a shit bench and I'm, and I'm working on it, but <laughs> by just, I, I would always add it in with like some Penley rows or like some other rows just to get like that pull motion. I think it is like, if you are going to do that, having that, that push pull, you know, combination, yeah. I think works really well. A hundred percent. And, you know, full disclosure, I've been bench pressing twice or three times a week for the last three months. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is what, what it really looks like to be comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. No, bench press, I think we can, uh, I think we could concur. Overrated. Any other ones that came to mind as you were kind of thinking? Um, the burpee? <laughs> oh, gosh, man. Jesus, dude. Like, Just going to shit on boot camps all here. Yeah, I, 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 I will. And this is one that I don't have anything good to say. And I cannot tell you that in the past like five decades, you can say I've spent any amount of time doing burpees. Yeah. Like, I just don't do them. I think they're worthless. They're stupid. There's so many other things that you can do that are going to be better for you. And worst of all, the people that are doing them are the ones that probably should do them the least because they don't have the necessary mobility or core stability to perform that movement safely. And it's always those people that you see where yes. they're, they're doing like the worm as they're doing the burpee. It's like this motion. And it's just like, oh my God, yeah. it's, a, it's a wreck. It's a wreck. So yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's one of those misconceptions about like a burpee or even like a body weight type exercises, even things like jumping jacks and like <laughs> aerobic type work. And, you know, if you've, uh, done so much with SFB, you realize like body weight work takes, sometimes it's the most technical things to do is actually manage your own body weight through strength exercises. We're actually the people, instead of doing that, it's actually probably safer to do a loaded exercise with some external weight in there versus, 
you know, using your own body weight, putting all that stress on your joints. So I, it's not just that it's kind of a shitty movement. I think it's really, you're not building any skills on it, but people think, I think it's a lot safer than it actually is when actually there's a lot of risk going on there. I think so too. I think so too. And yeah, yeah. I don't, I'm not a fan. Okay. Well, let's shift to the other side. Underrated exercise. What's the underrated exercises that you practice or that you found, you know, with clients that just maybe not as many people do, they don't know about them or just gives a lot more value than, than it's known about. I mean, this is going to be a, a very like far off extreme, but walking, mm-hmm. walking is probably the best thing that we can do for our bodies. Um, and if I look back, because I grew up in a rural community in Puerto Rico and, and gyms were not really a thing, you know, people that went to the gym were young people. And once he became a parent, like that, that was over, you know, mm-hmm. but people had active lives in that they walked everywhere. A lot of times, a lot of times like families didn't have a car in my hometown, you know, like, so they would walk together as a family to the grocery store and he would walk back. I remember we used to do that. It was like my uncle, my aunt, um and me we would go to the grocery store and buy all stuff and like walk home with it Mm -hmm. we were essentially doing like farmer's carries you know like when i was like eight years old or something you know yeah and and i remember a lot of people that were very like way older like 80 years old and they would walk everywhere and they were thin like they they were you know they looked like they had good body composition they had vibrant health like good vision good balance um it's an underrated exercise uh, yeah Yeah, especially, I mean, I grew up in the suburbs, but my parents grew up in the city in Queens, and then I lived in Boston for a bit. And just the difference of where you walk in the city and time. I remember that, like when we would go visit my grandparents in Queens, and there was a park a few, uh, you know, a few blocks down, and they were always with us at that time, like moving around. It is, it's like, it's one of those, it's the fountain of youth exercise. It's the non-sexy thing just to, to get into. But we, we used to talk about that when I was at the studio, like I went from like two or 3000 steps a day, like real, like, you know, you're a coach, like you think you're moving around a lot cause you're around it. But oftentimes you're just sitting there with like your hands in your pockets and like, you know, just test. I realized like, Oh shit, I'm like super sedentary. All of a sudden got out and walked a little bit more and body composition changes, just energy feels different by yeah. just getting out and just doing that. That's a beautiful thing that everybody should be prescribing to. A hundred percent. And I think as strength athletes, I think we get a little bit away from that, but we need, we need to be more. Now, if, if on the other hand, if you're somebody that's more on the traditional side and you're doing like, uh, like a bodybuilding style type of stuff, I think the getup would be one of the most underrated exercises that more people should do. Mm. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of articles and even like research that suggests that it's not as beneficial as it's like painted to be. I highly disagree The the degree of coordination, intermuscular coordination that needs to occur to make that movement happen fluidly, beautifully with the requirements of the movement, the elbow lock, wrist neutral, shoulder pack, core stabilized, eyes on the target, that whole movement is rather complex. And if more people did that, they would be saving their shoulders. They would be re-educating from a neural perspective, their course and their backs to be healthier and get more out of those sessions that they do in the gym when they're doing that bodybuilding style workout. So if I would recommend anything like that to to that fitness side of the house, it would be the Turkish getup for sure. Yeah. The getup's interesting because I've heard a lot of yeah, kibosh on it over the last, you know, year or so. With yeah. and I, there is something I think there's there's a line between how heavy you need to go with a getup to get the benefits of it. And you know, I know, and I know like, you know, simple sinisters out there. And I think if you can do, you know, 48 K getups, I worked on that for a long time. And I think there's a, you need strength to do that. However, like how, how heavy you need to go in it. I think that's where the debate could be valid on it. You know how Brett always talks about how the pe- we never see the pendulum mid swing and we always see it one or the other, right? Like it's always like some extreme. That's, extreme that either, sounds right? so Brett. It's not even funny. Yeah. Right. So, so unfortunately we find ourselves now at this extreme where people are doing this really heavy swings, really heavy cleans, really heavy snatches, really heavy getups. And in my humble opinion, that needs to stop quickly because it's just an avalanche of injuries waiting to happen. The kettlebell should be moved very fast with velocity when you are doing ballistics. What occurs when you're swinging like 140 pounds, unless you weigh 240 pounds, is that you won't be able to move it with speed it also it almost almost becomes this like 
grindy ballistic. <laughs> yes, yes. And you're just like, what is this? And so that's not beneficial. You're not really fulfilling the criteria of the movement in any way, shape, or form. The same thing happens with the get-ups. It's supposed to be this fluid movement. If you're out there shaking because the get up is so right, heavy, right. like it's, you're defeating the purpose. You're, it's actually detrimental to the nervous system to be put under that kind of stress. Um, you're, what you're learning is like, this is dangerous. I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. They create all kinds of problems for you. So yeah, very much against this extremes in the way that people are using a 24 kilo to 32. That's like the sweet spot for most men. Yeah. Unless you're like a giant, right? Like if you weigh 225 pounds, yeah, go for something heavier. But other than that, like what's the point, you know? Yeah, it, it's interesting because, you know, like when we had our studio here, like we had to get a board, like how heavy, like you could go and you put your initials there. And it was like a cool community type thing. But even as coaches, we would talk like afterwards. It's like, I think we were leading people down a path of thinking like, oh, that's what I need to do. If I'm making progress, it means my initials are going down that board, you know, heavier and heavier. And I've, I, you know, I worked up to a 56 K, you know, get up and it's, and, it's amazing. it felt, and it felt smooth. It felt good. But just the, the weight of that on, you know, my nice minuscule forearms here, like I felt it for days afterwards, you know, in there, cause it is, you know, heavy. So it's like, yeah, you can do it. Do you need to do it like often to, to build it up? And I think that's where kind of the back, I talked with Dan John a bit about this and he had an interesting kind of uh, breakdown of it. And I, th I think that's good. Even if you're a really strong dude, like 32 K like for, for the movement quality, as you said, Oz of like the core stability, the mobility of it, the proprioception, the athletic movement. Like, I think that that it's a phenomenal exercise that yeah. everybody you know should build up to. Actually, I found I don't know if you've done this before, but I've worked with a lot of people of just doing the ground based work get up, not even getting up to, to their feet, yeah. and seen some phenomenal stuff from just building strength. Yeah, and there's a great benefit with, with extracting the parts that are going to be most beneficial to that individual. Um, including teaching the the get up in reverse as Doug did back in the day, right? Like yes. There's all these little tricks, things that you can do. And that's why I love it. Look, it is my favorite of all the kettlebell movements, even more than the swing, even more than the press, any any of them. Mm -hmm. If if I had to do just one, it would be the getup. It's in my top five all-time exercises, the getup. It's, and, and it's because I really enjoy doing it. And I enjoy doing it with medium to heavyish loads, not too crazy. Like the, my, my max getup is a 44 kilo. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm very diligently working towards the beast, you know? Because I would love to do sinister, um, but I'm, you know, my style. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna enjoy the process. I'm not yep. gonna push anything and just become obsessed with. I gotta do this. Yes. No, like I'm not gonna do that. I need to enjoy the process, or else it means nothing to me. So that's what I'm doing. And that 32, 36, 40 kilo, beautiful. Yeah. Makes me feel like I can run through a wall, dude. Like, yeah. you know, when I do the 44, that's like a little bit like okay. Yeah, that's yeah. like you said, my tiny form, you know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I did, I got a kind of a bad taste for get ups for a while because I was, I was training for Sinister, I was really close. And then when lockdown happened, like a lot of different just mental work came because, like, when you go for something like that, it's more than tr more than physical training is going on, especially. I mean, I'm you know, I'm a light guy, I'm 155 pounds, like to do you know, 106 pounds swings and then get ups on this, it's going to take some good force. So I almost got like, I took some time off, almost got like a bad taste for heavy get ups, then started going back and doing like a 24 to 32 and just taking the time and kind of re fell in love with the movement of it. And now it's like getting like a 24 or 28 K and just kind of going through it almost like a yoga move. It's actually, there's a really beautiful connection to it. So I almost kind of like doing it again after not doing it, you know, for a while. And my go-to has to be probably snatching just because I feel so good just snatching. It just feels awesome. But I'm starting to, I'm starting to re-get into the getup. I'm glad to hear that you have reconnected with, with <laughs> this uh, movement because it's, it's just wonderful. I think it's great for people. And I see myself doing it until like, re like really old. I think that's one of the things that we can take into our old age easily, you know, like yes. I don't really see myself doing like barbell snatches at 80, maybe, you know, um, but right. I see myself doing, you know, uh, Turkish get-ups at, you know, well into my seventies and eighties, you know? 
Yeah. Oh, especially, I mean, especially just the movement of it in general, you know, it's like, you don't even need to work. It is funny that, you know, you mentioned it of kind of like the lower uh, weight work. Talking with Tim Almond was really interesting to me because he's done so much stuff with snatch breakdowns and stuff. And he's an insanely strong dude. And he's playing around with like double twenties and like a 24 K like where he could easily do like twice that. Like I've seen him snatch the beast, like for 10 reps and like freaking smooth as silk yep. playing around with a 24 and a 28 and stuff like that. And then I remember even seeing guys like Brett who are, you know, crazy strong doing like 24 kilogram practice type stuff. And it's like, okay. And you know, see Derek Toshner at all his snatching work, he does practices snatching with a 16 K bell, like lighter bells for a long time. It's like, these are really strong people. They're using very light weights. There's gotta be a reason for it. Yeah. Well, there's so much performance to be extracted from that very pure focused technical type of approach. Um, and that's best done with lighter loads because then you can really get into the nitty gritty of it. But then what happens is that you have patterned it so well your like uh, nervous system is so like tuned into that movement that when you go up, it feels effortless. And isn't mm -hmm. that what we, we talked about this last time, right? Like that, that um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're on the highway and you find yourself passing the others and you weren't even trying, Jesus, that's like, that's good. That's yeah. what we want. And, and so I think like, you know, one protocol that was famous years ago, I don't, people don't talk about it so much anymore, was the uh, the VO2 max from Kenneth J. Yes. That? Yeah, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And it was like, uh, for, for my weight at the time, so I was like walking around like a 155 around your weight okay. at the time. And I was doing the 16 kilo. And it was every 14 seconds, it was yep. like seven reps, seven reps, seven reps. Um, with 14 sec or 15 seconds. So I'm sorry. It was 15 on, 15 off. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the goal was like 40. You, you worked up to like, like 80 sets, right? Like 40 minutes on there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And well, I remember that was just a 16. And then I went to an RKC to assist here in San Diego at the JCC. I was under Team France, I remember. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know that I had to test. I was just like, and they were like, hey, you ready to test? And I was like, Fuck, okay, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I grabbed the 24 and I started doing it, man. And, and I remember just kind of like about 30 reps in feeling like, holy shit, like this feels really light. Yeah. And I was catching the bell with my fingers, like with the hook, mm -hmm. you know, when it gets like the timing is perfect. It's like, I'm tossing it right behind my legs. And Dave Whitley comes up, he's walking up and Franz is counting my reps. And Dave goes like, you look strong. And then he just keeps going. Like, oh, that's <laughs> awesome, you know? <laughs> that just like, that brings your strength up another 10% right off the bat, right? Totally, dude. I finished and I remember I was just feeling like, oh, this is awesome. But I, I had been doing 16 kilos for like six months. Yeah. So yeah, I, I remember that. I remember that protocol. Like that was a, that, there's some really good protocols out there. Um, yeah. uh, so to be continued, we just dove into this for an hour. We got to do another round three on this because yes, we still got more stuff, but dude, so great to see you. Thanks so much for coming back on. I appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you as always. Absolutely. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Go follow us. You know where to do so. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found some great value here. And if you like this episode, please drop a comment and leave us a five-star rating and review. It does more to build the show than you can imagine. And do not forget to check out and join the Strength Connection Facebook group. In this group, I share the biggest takeaways and lessons from these amazing conversations, as well as training and strength tips for pursuing mastery and fulfillment in life. It's, this group is filled with individuals looking to take full control over their strength, and it's the perfect space to explore new ideas and to share your journey. And you'll also get exclusive access to the Strength Connection Mastery Seminars. It's a deep dive into the physical, mental, and spiritual training that you can begin using immediately. So do not wait, go now. Seriously, go. I right, much love to you. Thank you so much, and I'll catch you on the next one.